This morning's scripture reading will be taken from Psalms 51.10. Psalms 51.10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. We are thankful that you came this morning. We know you do it out of responsibility to the Lord. We know you do it out of love for the Lord. But we're thankful personally as well. Psalm 51 is where we'd like to study this morning. I invite you to keep your Bibles open there. But we'll start just one other place. You've probably noticed that people have a good habit of pointing fingers at each other for wrongdoing. It's not a good habit. It's a bad habit. But boy, is it well played out in the world. You notice it on television. You notice it in the political realm. You notice it in family realms. You notice it in about every situation you can come that everybody points at somebody else when something goes wrong to lay the blame. You know it's been happening since the very beginning of time. God made Adam out of the dust of the ground and seeing that he needed a companion he took a wife out of his rib and then Adam and Eve had been warned not to eat of the tree of the garden that that was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But nevertheless, they did. Eve saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasing to the eyes and desirable to make one wise, and she took of the fruit and ate and gave to her husband, and he ate, Genesis 3, verse 6. And then they became ashamed of themselves. They knew that something was wrong. Sometimes I have trouble trying to think about how to define sin to a secular world, to people that just have no mindset about a God and have no mindset that there might be such a thing as conscience and to people who've been taught that their way is right and you can choose whatever way you want and that's going to be right and everybody else just better fall in line. How do you teach the idea of, of sin? Well, One idea is shame. People are going to feel shame for certain things no matter what the teachings of the atheists might be. Well Adam and Eve felt shame. And then God started to look for them when they hid themselves. He knew where they were, but it's figuratively speaking, he's looking for them. And he asks Adam, what happened? Why are you hiding yourselves? Adam plays the first blame game twofold in just a short sentence. He says in Genesis 3 verse 12, the woman, so he's blaming the woman, you gave me, so he's blaming God, gave me of the fruit to eat and I ate of it trouble with blame games sometimes is that sometimes there's some truth in them. Did God give him the woman? Yes. Did the woman give him the fruit to eat? Yes. But did that negate Adam's personal responsibility? No. To the point that in the new covenant he bears the responsibility in the inspired words of scripture through as, for as through Adam all sinned or all brought sin into the world and all died. So in Christ all shall be made alive. Verses like that in Romans chapter 5 verse 12. The blame game started early. But then I'm reminded of the old adage that's not from scripture but from good old common sense people of a former generation and maybe you've said it yourself. That anytime you point a finger at somebody you have three pointing back at you. Now there is a time to point out sin. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 11. Romans chapter 16 verses 17 and 18 reminds us that there's a time to note a divisive man who speaks contrary to the scriptures and avoid him. As Mark mentioned in class, Paul pointed out Alexander the coppersmith as one who had done much harm and was capable of much more harm. There is a time to see the false prophets because of the fruits that they bear. Matthew 7, 15 through 20. But we been, haven't been talking about that and that's not the subject today. The last three weeks we've spoken of the Apostle Peter. His recognition of himself as a sinful man at the beginning of his life. His cataclysmic failure after even some growth in the middle of or towards the end of Christ's ministry. And then his restoration through the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. In that context, we mentioned the first five verses of Psalm 51, in which David acknowledges his sin after his great 
earth-shattering trials that he inflicted upon himself by his affair with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband. He said in verse 1, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. And then he speaks in great hyperbole when he says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. That's just how bad he felt. But pick up from there in verse 6. Verse 6 sticks out and strikes you if you're one that understands something about the idea of examining one's heart. In verse 6 of Psalm 51, David says, Behold, you, that is God, desire truth in the inward parts, in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. God desires truth in the inward parts. We can all make a show. We can all show up to events. We can all show up to as many church services as we like. We can all show up to do good deeds. We can even make a trumpet before ourselves and blare the giving of good deeds, as Jesus pictures in Matthew 6. But what God wants is truth in the inward parts. Jeremiah said, the heart is very deceitful above all things. Who can know it? Sometimes people can deceive themselves even. But what God desires is truth in the inward parts. So we have a world that's crippling itself with a blame game. With everybody pointing to each other. Sometimes it happens in the church. Most often it happens in the world. The focus this morning is the rest of Psalm 51 where David, as a man, takes responsibility for the things that he has done, humbles himself before God and asks for God's help in enduring it all. And asks for God's help in being restored to the salvation that he once knew. It occurs to me that there's a time for that. Just like Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says there's a time for everything. Time to be born, a time to die, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to weep. There's a time for everything. Well, there's a time to point out where people are wrong based on the fruits of what they're doing. That's true. Even though people have Matthew 7 verse 1 memorized, judge not that you be not judged, they neglect the rest of the chapter that tells you to point out those who are false prophets and acknowledge those who are, who are dogs, sinfully speaking. Well, there's a time for that, but there's a time for introspection. That's what we've been aiming at, and that's what we'll conclude this morning. You desire truth in the inward parts, and you desire, and, you, and in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. First of all, David says after that, he speaks of a washing that makes some relief. He says in verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. I don't know exactly what hyssop was. There was some offered to Jesus for different, maybe a pain-killing agent, but sometimes it was just a cleansing agent from all I can understand from the dictionaries that I read, and they all have some sort of different take on it. But, you know, dictionary use comes after contextual clues, and here the contextual clues just let you know that it's something that has to do with a cleansing agent. And we all at some point like to be clean. I remember that very well. We all like to be clean. We don't like to be dirty, especially in our day and age. There was a time when people didn't take too many baths. and There was a time that cologne and perfume in the medieval times was put on people. Anointing oil was put on people in the time of Christ because there was not quite as much opportunity for flowing water. I was joking with some people recently that uh, I remember a time growing up running around my neighborhood, getting dirty every day. We had to take a bath every Saturday night, whether we needed it or not. You know, that was about it. And then when I became a teenager and started showering every day, my mom said, you're going to wash all your hair out. And I guess she lived to see the, uh, the fruits of that. We like to be clean. Here David's looking inside of his soul at the inward parts. And he wants to be clean. He doesn't want any guilt. He doesn't want any shame. But he knows he's done stuff that cause shame. He knows he's done things that cause trouble for other people. Isn't it one of the worst feelings in the world that you do something and it causes trouble for someone else? I can think of times in my life where I question the decisions that I made and I wonder if I hurt my children. 
I don't know of anything that gives me much more pain than that, that might, some choice that I made might have hurt some of the people that I love the very, very most. David was tired of that pain. He's tired of that. And he says, wash me, cleanse me. In verse 8, he says, make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Now there, there's a vivid picture for you. Some of you have had broken bones. So far, as of this morning, I've never had a broken bone in my life. Thankful for that. I've had some sprains. Those healed. I don't feel any pain from them. I've heard that sometimes a sprain is worse because you have residual pain from it, but a bone heals. I don't know if that's true or not. But I've known several of you that have gone through, gone through hip replacements, knee replacements. You go through those things, and there is a time that you are immobilized. One part of your body hurts, and the rest of your body tries to compensate, but it also hurts. There's a time that you're immobilized from a broken bone. You can't really do anything because of that broken bone. At least some of your skills are put to rest while you have that broken bone until it heals. But notice that David, speaking spiritually, does not hope for just healing. He hopes to exceed healing, go way beyond recuperation and rejoice. Verse 8, make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. This is poetry where you put together all kinds of different images to help people understand the spiritual things about what you're speaking. Purge me with hyssop. Well, hyssop can't go to your soul, only goes on the outside of your body. Or maybe the stuff that Jesus drank right inside the body. But that doesn't go to the soul, it doesn't go to the spirit. Here's an illustration. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make my bones heal to the point that I rejoice that they're stronger now. And don't bones do that sometimes? I've heard if you break a bone, sometimes it'll heal back stronger. I don't recommend anybody go break a bone and see if that happens. But you have, this is the kind of thing that David is speaking about in verse 8. Wash me. Break my bones but heal my bones. Bring me back to rejoicing. And then he speaks of a separation from God that would be a merciful separation from God and not a punitive separation from God. By punitive we mean punishment and there is coming a punishment, a punitive separation from God for all those who do not know him or obey the gospel. He'll turn his face away from them. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 9. But here David is acknowledging I've done something wrong and I don't need to be in your presence because you're holy. So he asks please hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. God please just turn your face. Don't look at me. Blot out my iniquities. Please stop the trouble. Stop my shame. So there's a washing that makes for relief about which David speaks. And secondly, in this passage, there's a spirit that makes for renewal. That's verse 10 that Jacob read for us in that nice deep voice. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. My heart sin. You don't, heart, you don't sin outwardly till your heart sins. You don't commit adultery outwardly till you've committed it in your heart. You don't murder somebody till you've been angry at them so long in your heart. Read Matthew chapter 5. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Now wait a minute, wasn't it up to David and his free will to create in himself a clean heart? Yes, it is up to him and his free will, but he's already made that decision. Now he's asking for it. Is it wrong to ask God for help in creating in us a clean heart? No. And where's the only way we're going to find a clean heart? Through God's revelation. That's what he says in the next verse. Do not cast away from me your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. In the next verse, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. I need to be animated by your spirit, O God. Please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Now I could digress here. And I suppose if we wanted to, it'd be valid to do it, but I don't want to do it right now. How do you reconcile this with the idea that the Holy Spirit is the seal of redemption for those in the new covenant as you read in Romans chapter 8 and Ephesians chapter 1 when David says don't cast your Holy Spirit from me but I think we'd be missing the point if we dwelt there too long David is simply asking that divinity form his humanity rather than allowing the lust of the world to form his humanity isn't that where it is you know what animation is 
Some of us are old enough to remember before CGI, and I don't know how CGI is done. I can barely spell CGI. But you, before CGI was done, we'd draw a picture and then draw another picture where it was a little bit, somebody was further down the road, and another picture where the guy was further down the road, another picture further down the road. And then we'd flip through it and make our own little cartoon because that's how animation used to be done at the very basic level. And what you're doing with animation is you're taking something that is inanimate, there's a picture, there's pencil drawing, there's ink on paper or something, lead on paper, and you're, you're bringing it to life. You're animating it. And then when someone voices a character in an animated movie, if he does a really good job, they'll say that, per that actor brought that character to life. Even if you're not animating something, you're just taking a script that is a play with a fictional character and you perform the part well, somebody will say, you brought that character to life. Well, David has died in his spirit. Chad read to us from Ephesians chapter 2, that's what happens. And you are dead in trespasses and sins. Romans chapter 8 speaks of how we walk in the flesh or in the spirit. And if, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his, Romans chapter 8 verse 9 says. And then he says in verse 10, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Well, you're sort of a walking dead person if you're just walking in sin. If you're only following the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, you're just working to you, so you can get to the party on the weekend. You're just working so you can have money to try to fulfill yourself. You're only working to try to be able to do the next fun thing. If that's your only purpose, may I suggest to you, biblically speaking, you're just dead. And you need animation. Not from Disney artists. You need animation from God. Christ in you. Jesus said in John 14 verse 23, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will come to him, and we will make our home with him. David is begging God, Don't depart from me, but animate me once again. Let me be in this divine setting with you. In 2 Peter chapter 1, I believe it is, Peter says that we are partakers of the divine nature. When we're Christians and we're washed from our sins because we've given our hearts to God and followed through on the steps of obedience that He has required, then we are partakers of the divine nature. And we're just readying ourselves for an eternity to be with Him. But the world distracts from that, pulls us away, wants us back. The devil doesn't care about you so much till you're a Christian. And then he's going to throw everything he has at you because he's so jealous and so small and so, so evil, that's where we get devil from, that he just wants everybody back. He's not going to give anybody up to God without a fight. But David says, I'm going to fight. God, please don't cast your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of salvation and uphold me with your generous spirit. Well, there's a washing that makes for relief then. And then there's a spirit that makes for renewal and then you know what happens after that in verses 13 and following? There's conversion that makes for, well, more conversions. David says in verse 13, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. All right, God, if you make me whole, I'll go teach transgressors your ways. Sinners will be converted to you. God, please restore me, and then I can tell others about this, because this is the best news ever. Now, this was before Christ, in anticipation of Christ. But still, people needed to follow God and do His will at that time. And David wanted to let people know about the merciful kind of God that we serve, whose grace is greater, as the song says, than all our sins. His grace far surpasses anything that we could ever do. And that doesn't license us to go do, but it does license us to look in the past and say, God can forgive that. And if he restores to me the joy of salvation, then I can go and teach transgressors his ways and sinners shall be converted. I've heard people use the argument when raising kids, well, I can't tell my kids not to do that. I did that. I can't tell my kids not to. Buddy, if I use that as a rule for my, raising my kids, my kids would be in a lot of trouble. I made a lot of dumb mistakes. And every once in a while, the kids would pull that with me. Well, didn't you do that, Dad? Yes, and that's why I'm telling you not to. 
Don't want you to have the pain that I had. Don't want you to experience the remorse that I did. Don't want you to get in the situation that I was. Teach me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Then I'll teach transgressors your ways and, I'll, and, and sinners shall be converted. And then in verse 14, O God, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed. Now I haven't shed blood. I haven't committed adultery. But sin in that regard in the sight of heaven is sin. And so when there was sin, there's something to be forgiven. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, David says. Then my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. When there is this restoration to a new spirit, then a person wants to be evangelistic. He doesn't want to hold back. He wants to tell people what Jesus has done for him. Then a person is going to sing aloud of God's righteousness while the world sings its wickedness, while the world presents its evil, murderous ways. Somebody's out there saying God is righteous. There is a God. He is right. There is a God. He forgives sin. There is a God. He has a better place for us. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. We praised God in song. We can praise God when we're out. We don't have to be like some people who seem to maybe be a little over the top with it, with a praise the Lord that almost becomes flippant for everything. But we sure can, with good reason, thank God for our food at a restaurant before we eat it. We sure can with good reason, we don't have to make a show of it, we sure can with good reason express to friends, I'm thankful to God that this happened. It shows forth that you have a purpose beyond you. Open my lips, O Lord, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. And after that, there is in this passage a brokenness that makes worship acceptable. I don't know if you've ever thought about it like that before, you probably have. But it takes brokenness in human spirits to make our worship acceptable to God. Watch verse 16. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. Now hold on. When you get to a verse like that in the Scriptures, you realize that God's the one who instituted burnt offerings. God's the one who instituted sacrifices in the Old Covenant. So why doesn't He like them? Why doesn't He delight in them? Well, you read on and you'll see. Verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Well, he'll go on to say, verses 18 and 19, which we'll get to momentarily, that once you make the sacrifices of a broken spirit and a broken heart, once your heart is right with God, then he does accept the worship that you offer. Then he will accept the whole burnt offering. Then he will accept your sacrifices. There are passages like that in Isaiah chapter 1. There are passages like that in Isaiah, Amos chapter 5 where God says, stop bringing your sacrifices to me. First, help the fatherless. Plead the cause of the widow. Do good for people around you. Stop with your hypocrisy and then maybe I'll hear your worship. I do not enter. I cannot enter, I should say. I cannot enter the presence of God with pride. How many do that? How many try to enter the presence of God with pride? I'll give this, but that's all I'm giving to you, God. No, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, like David has when he pleads, don't cast me away from you. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. My heart is broken because I've sinned, and I desperately want some healing. I want this burden of shame taken away. And then David looks beyond himself to his peers in verse 18. Do good in your good pleasure in Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Now this kind of turns the corner to a different area, so much so that some of your liberal scholars will say that these two verses don't fit at the end of this psalm. Because David lived 1000 B.C. and the walls needed rebuilt 500 B.C. So these verses must have been written and some scribe accidentally put them here. But they're missing the point. We're not talking about anything literal. Literal hyssop or literal broken bones in this passage. 
We're talking about things spiritual and what these words indicate when he says, do good in your good pleasure to Zion, build the walls of Jerusalem. He's saying, make your people strong. That was the location of God's people at that time. God put his temple in Jerusalem, not through David yet, but through his son Solomon. God had his dwelling place in the tabernacle there first. Do your good pleasure in Zion. And you know what that teaches us? David's been focused on himself all this time through this passage. Rightfully so because he's done wrong and he needs to get his heart right with God. But it quite importantly tells us that David can't do it alone. He needs his peers and he has concern for his peers, his brothers in the Jewish nation. Do good for them. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. What that would translate for us today is that no one serves God by himself. Being a loner is a non-starter for a right relationship with God. Well, I don't need those people. I'll just watch my TV. Well, I don't need those people. I'll just do things on my own. I don't need that. I'll just sit back here. I don't need any fellowship with those people. That's a non-starter for a right relationship with God. It takes your peers. And once David finally gets to the point in this psalm that maybe he's starting to feel some forgiveness, he remembers, God, please bless my peers. And it might be like us saying, God, please bless the church. Maybe I've hurt the church with my sin. Any sin hurts somebody. And any sin hurts one's reputation. And any sin hurts the people around him. And any sin hurts the church and brings reproach on the church. God, please be with the church. Do your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Today, build up your church, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Then, verse 19, you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. You see, God's not against worship, but he is against worship with the wrong heart. He is against the show of worship. He is against pride in worship. He wants our sacrifices. He wants, in the new covenant age, He wants our singing, and He wants our giving, and He wants our praying, and He wants our partaking of the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day, and He wants our preaching. He wants our worship. But He wants our hearts first. Otherwise, our worship means nothing. So my first tendency is to look at everybody else and see what's wrong with them. But that has to be replaced by looking at me, and I mean me, seeing what's wrong with me. You desire truth in the inward parts. God wants wisdom within me, and in the hidden part you make me know wisdom. Where is your heart? Christians can become prideful and straying, even though they're all the time present. A hypocrite can put on a show. But where is your heart? God knows it. Make it right with God. And then there are people who refuse an initial submission to Christ. That refusal may be permanent should he come back someday before you're ready. Don't refuse him. Your initial submission consists of being washed through the whole process of confessing a faith in Christ Repenting of sins, being buried in the waters of baptism, and raised to walk in newness of life. There's no power in the water, but the power is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the command that he gave to do this. 1 Peter 3 verse 21. If we could baptize you into Christ this morning, or pray for you and with you about a neglectful heart, would you please come forward as we stand and sing to encourage you. I am God.